are going to talk with Nadia in a few minutes, but first we want to uh, welcome everybody to Teaching Nonviolent Atonement. My name is Adam Erickson. I'm Suzanne Ross. And uh, at Teaching Nonviolent Atonement, we use mimetic theories wisdom for transforming Christianity in a violent world. And what we mean by that is that mimetic theory helps us understand scripture and the cross is an act of communication from a non-violent God, and that is radical because our theology is just consumed with violence, and if we can get violence away from our understanding of God, that would be awesome, but then it asks the question, where is the violence coming from? And uh, it's coming from us. We are a violent, stiff-necked people. And uh, René Girard, the discoverer of mimetic theory, uh, stumbled upon an insight about violent atonement that turned classic atonement theories upon an inside, uh, upside down. His insight, violent atonement is purely human phenomenon. We habitually reconcile ourselves and our communities by uniting against a scapegoat in ways that become more and more explicitly violent, from gossip to cliques and bullying to prejudice to terrorism and to war. We don't need God for all of that. We accomplish violent atonement quite well on our own. Right. So we call ourselves teaching nonviolent atonement to distinguish God's atonement from ours. Uh, so God reconciles humanity through accepting our violence even unto death. We reconcile through imposing death on others. So Moses and Jesus were on the same page here. Moses set before us the way of life and death. Jesus said that he gives us peace, but not the world gives. So we think the mimetic insight restores the prophetic role to the church and speaking to the nations. So if you think that's intriguing, please, we hope you'll continue to engage with us on our Facebook page and to join our chats, because with our, on our chats we talk with theologians and philosophers and preachers and teachers who are working either explicitly or implicitly with this idea of nonviolent atonement and mimetic theory. Uh, who do we got coming up next week? Aha! So next week we're talking with Ramal Toon. Awesome. Ramal Toon is um, the author of God's Graffiti. If you're in youth ministry, you've probably run across um, Ramal's work. He's the founder and executive director of Faith for Change, and he challenges churches to learn from what gangs are doing. Rather than scapegoating gangs, he says maybe we could serve at risk, risk youth better by learning from what gangs are doing well. It's a very challenging and a little bit scandalous proposition, which leads us into the month of March where we are going to be discussing all month the idea of scandal, yeah. which is a big idea in mimetic theory because the term scandal on in the Gospels, Jesus uses it quite a few times, and it's often translated as stumbling block. Mm -hmm. And how scandal is a stumbling block to our salvation is a critical idea in mimetic theory. So we're going to start the month of March off with talking with Jim Warren, who's the author of a new introduction to mimetic theory called Compassion and Apocalypse. Yeah. So he's going to give us the basics. Compassion um, or Apocalypse. What did I say? You said and. It's ah, or. Because it's those or. are the choices that we have. Either compassion or we will destroy ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's about go. it. <laughs> and then we are going to speak with um, Paul Nectarline, who we speak with on a monthly basis. He is the author of Girardian Reflections on the Lectionary, which is a massive compendium of resources for preachers who want to preach nonviolent atonement. Um, and Paul is an incredible resource for all of us, and he is a, just an angel to join us on a monthly basis and review the um, lectionary, the upcoming lectionary with us. And then in the third week of March, we'll be talking with Richard Beck, who is a professor in the, and the chair of psychology at Abilene Christian University. He blogs at uh, Experimental Theology, and he's the author of a great 
scandalous book called Unclean, Unclean. Meditations on Purity, Hospitality, and Morality. And Richard has been working with Mimetic Theory for a few years now, so he's going to be a fun and exciting uh, conversation. And then we're going to close out the month um, on March 27th with Jeremiah Alberg who is currently the um, Executive Secretary of COVER, the Colloquium on Violence and Religion, which engages um, in academic research on mimetic theory. And J Jeremiah, or Jay, as he's known, is Professor of Philosophy and Religion at International Christian University in Tokyo. And believe it or not, Jay has already joined us from Tokyo, so we know mm -hmm. that works. Mm -hmm. He can get to <laughs> us from Japan. Um, and his book um, came out last year. It's called Beneath the Veil of the Strange Verses, Reading Scandalous Texts. And it is one of those books that when you read it, you are transformed by it. So we are very excited to have that line up in March. Speaking of being transformed by people, we have Nadia Bowles Weber on the chat today who is helping to transform the faith of Christianity and the future of Christianity. Uh, Nadia is uh, the pastor at uh, House for All Sinners and Saints, and just to give you like a flavor for what Nadia is up to, uh, that acronym is HFAST, right, Nadia? Half ass. Half ass. That's how we do it. Half ass. I love it. I love it. And um, so what they do at Half Ass is they're an urban liturgical community with a progressive yet deeply rooted theological imagination. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. Progressive and rooted in yeah. tradition right. is just, um, just a powerful thing. And uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, Nadia posts her Sunday sermons on uh, Monday at her blog at Patheos Sarcastic Lutheran, the cranky spirituality of a postmodern gal. Uh, she is the author of the most recent book, called Pastrix, The Cranky, Beautiful Faith of a Sinner and Saint. I'll just throw that up there right there. Nadia, that is such a great picture of you. I love that. Thank you. Awesome. <laughs> and here's another great picture of you from your first book, Salvation on the Small Screen. I'm missing your face, but that's there for a reason, because you spent 24 hours watching Christian television. How did that go for you? And lived to tell the tale. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I actually had to do it twice because the first time we lost all of the um we lost all of the audio and everything. So I actually had to go through the entire thing two times. So Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Today was nothing. Yeah, right. <laughs> Technology. Well, did you find salvation on the small screen? Well, I mean, the only thing that makes that book even vaguely interesting is that there were moments where I was surprised I mean, because, you know, uh, Trinity Broadcasting Network is an easy target, right? And so anybody could write a book about sort of a snarky cultural commentary on that. So the only thing that makes the book actually interesting were the moments where I had to admit that something really beautiful was happening or that something somebody said was theologically, what I felt like was really theologically sound, uh, or times when I was sort of leveling questions at them that I turned on myself and I didn't have good enough answers for. So, yeah, I mean, it was I think that is some form of salvation every time we realize we're wrong about something. Yeah, yeah. It's one of the things that I love about that book. You, you end it by saying, you know, we Lutherans, we might be the peanut butter of the world and the evangelicals might be the chocolate of the world. <laughs> And we like to separate them, but if you put chocolate in, ch I love chocolate and I love peanut butter, and together they are amazing. Peanut butter M&Ms, I could eat those all day. Yeah. So bring these things together, and the beauty that you mm. find in both of them is something that you are trying to do, not only in that book, but in mm. Pastrix and in, in your life. And that's mm. so awesome, because what we tend to do is to scapegoat the other, to form an identity of being over and against whatever is not us. Um, yeah, and I, I mean, I think, that, I think that happens um, in every sector. And so I think sometimes it's ironic in the sort of what we would call more progressive Christianity, where we're supposed to have these 
ideals of inclusion and acceptance and what radical welcome and radical hospitality and the fact is is that um i feel like this you know our little tribe can be just as exclusive and prideful and dismissive of the other as the conservative church is and i think there's no place that we see this more readily than really on facebook i mean i feel like the pridefulness, the sort of liberal pridefulness on Facebook is insufferable. I mean, it, you know, it, any sort of thing that happens in the world is an opportunity to stake some sort of higher politically correct ground than everyone else. You know, it's like if we see people um, uh, celebrating something, then it's like an opportunity to place ourselves above them if we can post something on Facebook about why it's not okay. Why, why that's actually racist or that's and, and it's not that good analysis about these things isn't important to me it just it sort of just betrays the human heart uh in terms of our desire to place ourselves above others and so that can be done in a sort of like we're more welcoming than everyone else stance in the in the way that it can be done in a we're purer than we're morally purer than everyone else stance to me it's the same stance you know even the word progressive is problematic because if you're progressive, who's everybody else? Well, they're the re regressive. They're regressive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right, right. No, I, I appreciate that so much about your work, Nadia, because it is what you're asking is how are we forming identity? And a lot mm -hmm. of times that Facebook hmm, wrangling is all about trying to grasp after an identity as good because we all want to be good, right? We all think we're the good ones. And so I, I really enjoyed the chapter in your book where you talk about the, uh, I think it's the great Christian sorting machine or something where we can figure out that we're on, that we're saved, we're the good ones, and it tends to come down to questions of morality a lot of times. Yeah, yeah, I, um, but I think, I mean, I find myself doing that as well. And I think that one of the ways that God feels really active in the world to me are is in the way in which we end up constantly being surprised by grace like surprised by these realizations so here's an example i i, I write about rick strandloff in my book and rick was um rick is a fairly notorious con artist um who had a u.s supreme court case with his name attached to it a couple summers ago and um, who is very reviled for a lot of things that he's done in the world. Um, he's also a beloved member of our community. But this guy really is a fuck up. I mean, if anyone is, it's Rick, right? I mean, he spent, you know, he's an ex-con, all this stuff. And you, and you're never totally sure when he's being honest or not. But I'm telling you, I've been in a community with Rick for a few years now, and small, genuine, small acts of love come so much more naturally to this man than they ever do to me. I mean, over and again, I'm always humbled by the way, it, I'm humbled by Rick Stramoff. I, I, I wouldn't say that if it wasn't true. I mean, on, on, um, on All Saints, we have these little shrines to people who have died in our lives or people who are significant to us. And I had, there was a woman who took me in when I got sober I was just this really screwed up kid. I had no place to lay my head. And I met her, and she, she was a lawyer, and she took me in. She gave me a place to live. And, um, and you know, 22 years later, um, I ended up taking her confession and bringing her the Eucharist on her deathbed. And then I did her a, a little small sort, sort of a eulogy at her memorial service. And every morning when we lived together, she would drink coffee and read the New York Times. And so here it was, All Saints, and I was setting up this, little shrine to her of a beautiful picture, and I bought a copy of the Times, but I'd left it at Chipotle um, earlier for lunch, and I didn't have time to get it. Rick came up behind me, and he said, he said, Nadia, um, is that the woman you told me about? And I said, yeah, and I explained how I had a cup of coffee in her picture, but I'd left the New York Times, and, um, and he goes, well, I know that was really important. She was really important to you, and like 10 minutes later, I have this tap on my shoulder. You know, I'm fairly certain that he just has SSI income, this guy, Rick, right? And he he spent $6 buying me another copy of the New York Times, and he handed it to me, and he goes, he goes, it's impo this is important to you, and you really should have this today. And and he laid it there, and it, 
And that is just one small way in which Rick Strandloff, of all people, like humbles me in, in these things that the way in which it's very easy for him to love people I find challenging to love. So um, he like he's an example of, of like how completely screwed we are if we try to use the sorting system, which is a painful thing to enter into to be humbled by someone who you have would find easy to sit in judgment of. And I yeah, you, well, welcome story of my life. Are you kidding me? <laughs> that shit happens I, all the time. It happens all the time. You even you talk about it. I love the image in the book that you use that your heart has been broken so many times you wish you had a zipper installed so you could just, yeah. you know, ha do that heart surgery over and over. Yeah. And I would I would just add to that one of the cool things in the title of your book mm -hmm. is this saint and this sinner that yeah. runs down the middle of each one of us. It's it's like the good and evil that runs down the middle of each one of us. And I wonder if this is one of the important things that we need to learn about what it means to be human, especially the church needs to learn about what it means to be human in order to have a more welcoming, uh, better future that we live into um, the gospel. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um the fact that we're all simultaneously sinner and saint, I don't know that that's a novel idea so much as a description of reality, you know? I mean, at least for me, that that just 100% rings true. It's one of the reasons I'm a Lutheran. And um, I, I think Lutherans aren't necessarily a very idealistic people, right? Like I like to say, I'm I'm really not idealistic in any way about any human projects because there's always humans involved, right? And so <laughs> there's going to be something screwed up about that and something beautiful at the same time, every human project. But I'm completely idealistic about God's redeeming work in the world, the way in which God re redeems us and all of creation continually. That I'm very idealistic about. And so the ways that that can break into our human projects and redeem them and redeem us, that I'm idealistic about. Mm. Where, where do you see that um, breaking into our world, either at, um, either at your church or in the broader world? Are there, are there places where you see this happening? Well, I guess I just see it, I see it in my community a lot. I mean, you know, the thing I talk about in the book is how we welcome people to this church because some people, you know, the church is different enough that people end up when they come feeling a little idealistic about it because it feels like a, it's very different that they don't have to check part of who they are at the door and that they're accepted and that, you know, it's, um, there's a certain humor that they, you know, there are things they become idealistic about. And so we have this welcome to house brunch and everybody goes around and says why they came or what keeps them there. And really beautiful things are said and things that really ring true about the community. And then I always end that and I say, I love hearing that, but, here's what you need to hear me say is that this community will disappoint you. Like at some point we will let you down or not meet your expectations or I'll say something stupid and hurt your feelings. And I invite you on this side of that happening to decide if you're going to leave when it happens or if you're going to stay. Cause if you leave, if you leave, this is to your point, you'll miss the way that God's grace comes in and fills in the cracks left by our brokenness and our mistakes. And like that's way too beautiful to miss. And in a way, it's not really church until you have an opportunity to forgive and be forgiven, you know, in the community. And so um, it's hard because it doesn't mean that those things don't end up hurting. I mean, I, I wish there's something that happened in the last month in my community, and it's too close to be able to talk about it. So I can't really describe it. But that is to say that there was plenty of opportunity for people to be to forgive and be forgiven. And that happened on all counts. And it happened on all counts, not because the fact that we're just this naturally gracious, forgiving people. It's because we hear the gospel of, of who God is and how forgiving God is over and over and over again. So it's just, it's different. Is that, Nadia, because that's the question that, uh, I'm sure lots of people have is how do you create an environment in which 
that sort of vulnerability and forgiveness is possible. Um, and you, so you mentioned preaching uh, the word, preaching the gospel of forgiveness. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about the, how, the, in what ways the liturgy or um, orthodoxy, uh, cons- you know, plain old vanilla Christianity um, enables this kind of environment to happen. Well, you know, I can say that I, um, you know, I think it is, a, it, or at least it was recently a trend with Luther's plan. In the, in the liturgy, they wouldn't include the confession and absolution because they wanted to appeal to people. And, like, that makes people feel bad, you know. And I'm like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like, you can't, until they understand what they're being freed from, you can't proclaim the freedom and have that mean anything. And, man, if I took the confession and absolution out of the liturgy, I, I'd be run out of town. Like, that, it's such a critical part. And and I think that, you know, liberal or progressive, both terms, which I completely hate, but those churches sometimes don't want to talk about sin, right? Because I think they equate sin with, like, low self-esteem or something, which is really the only sin liberals can, you know, admit to being a sin. But... um. But I think that what happens when we step away from that orthodoxy is that we end up we end up uh, completely neutering, castrating the power that we have, the power of the gospel. Because now, what what kind of weight could that possibly have? Like, what could forgiveness even mean if we, if there's nothing for us to be forgiven of? And people walk around their lives holding the reality of the ways in which they have failed and things that they've not lived up to and stuff they wish they hadn't said and things that have been done to them that hurt. And all of that stuff is this reality people walk through the world with. And if the church can't talk about that, can't like put language to it in a sacred space and then talk about God's power within that reality, what are we doing? Then that's when I call it the elk club with Eucharist. You know, it's not, who's, who's up for that, you know? Right. One of the things that's really hard for people and churches who want to be inclusive is how do you include people who are other than us? Um, And you had a great experience uh, with this. It's one of those moments when you talk about um, how God reached into your uh, heart and transformed it into something softer, where um, you were giving a talk uh, at uh, somewhere in Colorado where a lot of people were there and then a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of those people started coming to your church and you talk about yeah. them as like business people and they're coming in and they're trying to, to mess up our community. Can you talk about that experience a little bit? Oh God, everyone wants me to tell that story and it's like, I, I looked at my husband the other day, I was like, I swear to God in book number two, one chapter where I come off looking good. That's all I'm asking. I just want one, man, because like, all my best stories are of me being an asshole. You know? <laughs> it's like all I really have to offer the world is, okay, here's another story of me being a total jerk. Um, yeah, because, you know, I had this, I told someone the other day that, like, I can't, like, I think you could tell the, the a history of my the congregation really as a series of things I was wrong about or mistakes I made. Like the whole story of it could be told. Each chapter could really be based in that. And um, and that was another case where I thought, well, we have to preserve the, we have to preserve the freakiness of this church so that, you know, these, that people on the margins will still feel comfortable here, you know? And so I thought that was really my job was to preserve that because, you know, these bankers with dockers or these sort of baby boomers from the suburbs, that they could go to any mainline church in the city and see a room full of people who look just like them. And I'm like, if they start coming to our church, and like, it'll mess up the cool, you know? And like, then like, you know, maybe some transgender kid who wouldn't feel comfortable because they just come in and it looks like all the other churches they aren't welcomed at, right? And so... This was, I was convinced was true, and of course was not. Uh, it was just something I'd convinced myself of. And um, and so we went through this process of sort of having a conversation as a community about that. 
And and I called my friend Russell and I said, what do you, you know, has this happened to you? And we like to think we were into welcoming the stranger, but then he said, sometimes, sometimes the stranger looks like your mom and dad, you know? And I, that was probably one of the worst things anybody had ever said to me. <laughs> that was, that has to be the most unkind thing anybody had ever said, <laughs> that sometimes the stranger looks like your mom and dad. So then we had a community meeting and, and one of our, you know, this young transgender kid spoke up and said, look, I'm glad there are people who look like my mom and dad here at my church because they love me in a way my mom and dad can't. And that's when, that's when the spirit really just changed everything, you know, and that's when I had another heart transplant. Now, I, the reason I, it's hard for me to tell that story isn't because it's embarrassing. I don't mind. I have no pride. I'll tell people embarrassing stories. But it's because of who we are now as a community and the fact that I can't, I literally cannot imagine House for All Sinners and Saints being House for All Sinners and Saints without those people, without the baby boomers, without the people who drive in. From, I, we literally are not us without them. They, they're, they, so it, it's hard for me to tell that story knowing the reality of how beloved these people are. And you know what? They also, they get shit done. Like, that's a population that, like, man, they they bring food to everything, and they, like, sign up for jobs, and oh, how do you have a church without them? I have no idea. So, <laughs> they're amazing. Well, one of the reasons why I wanted you to talk about it is because, as you said in the beginning, it's this experience where you realize that you were wrong about something. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is one of one of the key elements of Christianity is seeing the places in which we were wrong and where we can find kind of a, a conversion experience. James Allison, yeah. um, who, you, who you've come in contact with, and you've got that video on YouTube. I have a theological crush on him, yeah, totally. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't? I mean, this guy is awesome. But he's, got, he, he's been on the chat a couple of times. He's got this book called The Joy of Being Wrong. And that's really what I kind of get out of what you're saying about this experience. Like, there's like, during, while you're going through it, it sucks. Like, you hate being wrong. But yeah. as you come out of it and you see the beauty of this new transformed community, you get a mm -hmm. real deep of mm -hmm. joy out of, out, of, out of what comes out of it. No question. No question. It's, it's also like... We we have this idea that our lives are going well and we're doing things the right way. If things are calm and peaceful and we have this sense of well being happy and there's no conflict, that's when we're doing things right. When our when our lives are going well and we're great, right? But I've never learned anything during those periods of my life. They felt nice, but like I didn't grow and I didn't learn anything. I didn't, right. And so that growth and learning and change is totally forged from these difficult things and from conflict and from loss and all this stuff that we try to avoid or we think if we're experiencing it, something's wrong with us, like we've done something wrong, you know, when in fact, these are, there's always gifts in that. Hey, can I, you know, I just realized people were writing questions. Do you guys see those? Yes. I've got I've got one comment up here that I want to read to you. Um, it's from a principal. Uh, her name is Nicole. Nicole says, uh, "What you are saying so speaks to building a community in general." As an elementary school principal, I'm struck by how your description of your church community and the acceptance of disappointment so resonates uh, with the community that she has. Um, I lost it here, but uh, with her life as a professional life. Um, and if, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, if I were to put that into a question, it would be something like what you're doing at, um, at the church in trying to build this inclusive community, is it having an effect on your members and how they're building community uh, out in, in their life at work, in their professional life, at home? Um, do you see anything like that happening? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know, but that would be an awesome question to ask them. <laughs> I mean, I think it is, and I mean, I, I guess I hear, I do hear people talking about how, um, you know, there was some kind of conflict or their boss was a total ass, 
and if it was a year and a half ago, they would have reacted this way, and yet now they're reacting this way, and that kind of sucks because there's this enjoyment you get, <laughs> you know, there's this, like, enjoyment you get out of not liking someone or out of, you know, talking smack about them to other people so that they can be on your side or whatever, and I think that, I mean, what I've heard in a few people's stories is the fact that they've they've come to terms so much with their own brokenness and with being forgiven in themselves that it's it's uh, it sort of forced them in an uncomfortable way almost to not stand in judgment of other people. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're pointing to, Nadi, is what we try, what we talk about here a lot in terms of mimetic theory because um, mimetic theory teaches that it's not that there's just one way to form community. There's actually two ways to form community. There's the way through violence, through exclusion, through feeling good about being better than other people. That's the way of the world, of, to form community. And then there's the way of forming community that Christ offers. And it's not, the reason it's so hard to follow Christ is because the way of the world works a lot of times. It makes us feel good and happy, like you're saying. Very efficient. It's efficient. Yeah. It works. We get a job. Yeah. And how you wean yourself off of that way yeah. of knowing yourself and being good at forming community into this other way that requires pain and suffering to get there, man, that's why you're such a good preacher. You're, you're calling people to a difficult path. Yeah, but um, I, I, I only think that really – can work in community. I don't. I don't think that. I don't think you go that other way, as a as a project of just individual self improvement. You know. I mean, I'm forced by seeing like this, such love and beauty and Rick Strandloff, right? But to to sort of be on that path again. It's not because I'm choosing it out of like I sort of want to be a better. I just want to be a better person. I'm really. Some, oh my God! Someone asked me in a Q and A a few weeks ago. They said, um, "Hey Nadia, what do you do personally to get closer to God?" And before I even realized I was saying it, I was like, "What? Nothing. Why would I do that? Like that sounds like the worst idea I've ever. I wish the guy would leave me alone. I'm not pursuing God at all. Like it does not feel like I am pursuing God. It feels like God is hunting my ass down all the time. So it doesn't." I just don't think any sort of spiritual pats on the back. I don't have like these sort of spiritual pats on the back coming, you know. Um, it, it does feel like something I endure over and over again. That is beautiful and redemptive and transformative, but it's not as a result of like um, spiritual self-improvement at all. Yeah, yeah. I love it. You, uh, and one of the things that I was looking at, you were talking about um, climbing the spiritual ladder. And a lot of times people want to climb the spiritual ladder, and you were like, God is climbing the spiritual ladder down to us. It's not about right. us. It's God's initiative. And I See, just think what that's you were talking about, the difference between the sort of the way of the world and the way of Christ, Lutherans talk about that as the difference between theology of the cross and theology of glory. And um, maybe I'll post that on my on my public Facebook page today. Um, I wrote some very, very sort of <laughs> slanted, one-sided notes comparing theology of glory to theology of the cross. So um, just to sort of put that out there for people. I like it. Say more about that. We've got, we've got one person asking, uh, what does all of this have to do with atonement? Can you talk about theology of the cross and atonement and where you go with that? Yeah, I... Um, I think that in order to have my, I guess my sort of atonement, I don't use that word so much, but um, really is deeply Trinitarian, meaning it has a very high Christology to it. Because what I see in a lot of atonement theory is just Jesus is just God. You know, in the book, I was so snarky about this. I was like, you know, God's little boy, and he only had one. He only had one, you know, and he had to like, he had to kill him because you're bad. You say swear words and you call it, you you think to yourself your teacher's a bitch and you're so bad and that's why God had to kill his one little boy. He only had one. I mean, it's just such bullshit that I just this. I mean, I feel like what we can know 
about God, like so much of God is unknowable to us. And Luther talks about the backside of God, like the fact that we should be glad that a lot of, of God's unknowable to us. That means we are the creatures and God is the creator. And so, so much of who God is is unknowable to us, but what we can reliably know about God's nature, we know in the way that God chose to reveal who God is in the person of Jesus Christ, right? And so, that's what we can reliably know. So, um, I feel like a lot of other stuff is really our projections. It's kind of like we take the worst of ourselves and then project that on God. Like God would be as spiteful and vengeful and revenge-seeking as I am. Well, surely, I mean, if, if I was God, that's how I'd be. So I assume that's how God is, right? And so um, what we see on the cross is the opposite of that, meaning that's not what we would ever come up with ourselves. We would never come up with that as the fullest expression of God saying, this is forever now how I want to be known, right? Like, I'm done with all this other stuff. I am showing you who I am at the cross, especially. And so, um, to me, the, the sort of, it, it just shuts all of our stuff down. I, I think it just shuts it down. And so, Lutherans really believe more than anything in this blessed exchange, meaning that what's happening there is that all of our stuff, meaning our revenge seeking and our violence and like what you guys would say, our scapegoating, all of that stuff there is allowed to, to go to its logical conclusion, which is the suffering of God. That creates God, suffering in God, right? And so... When taken to its logical conclusion, it looks like it looks like the cross, right? And so that God would voluntarily sort of endure that means a couple things. One is that it's like taking all of our junk and then exchanging God's blessedness for it. So any righteousness that we have is the righteousness of God. It's not the righteousness of our own works, right? It's, it's of God. So it's like we got the best end of that deal. Like the, it was just the switcheroo, right? So we, our righteousness is never our own in Lutheran thinking. And so the other thing it do, does is, is it says that God is especially present in the places that we think is, are God forsaken. That, I mean, we would never come up with that. What self-respecting God would get himself crucified and killed in a completely preventable way? So it's shameful, right? We would never choose this. And so God's saying, look, the inversion of human power is how I'm, I'm choosing to come to you, you know, in a cradle and in a cross. So um, it, we're just forever sort of stymied by that and having to deal with the fact that then also all of the places in our lives that we think God is not present God is actually especially present. Yeah, God loved us while we were yet sinners. Yeah. Right? So we did nothing to earn that. That's the the grace and I think that's so um that it's I think it's so important for you to point out that the cross was a place of shame because mm -hmm. we do a lot of damage to each other trying to avoid being put in the place of shame. We we don't want to go there. And uh, where that's the place where God ran to, <laughs> as, you know, mm -hmm. in a sense, to proclaim that place, to detoxify it, is what James Allison would say. Yeah, To detoxify right, right. the place of shame, so that right. we don't have to spend all this energy avoiding it and putting other people in it. Um, but, I mean, that's yeah. so much what we see in so much religious leadership, people trying to avoid any sort of, uh, any sort of, uh, of their own broken, people seeing their own brokenness of their own shame, and then always having to put other people in that place of shame. And um, But I think in, especially in sort of more postmodern communities, more millennial type communities, I think people want religious leaders that are transparent, that, that aren't afraid to do that, that are sort of, like, I don't spend any energy defending or protecting my authority, for instance, none. Like, it's like a really worthless project to me. So, therefore, I think people are more apt to allow me to have authority because I'm not doing things to protect it, like pretending I'm someone I'm not or hoping people don't see. 
my vulnerabilities or whatever. I think that's such a brilliant move on your part, uh, especially like starting off and telling people explicitly, I am going to fail you. Like this church is going to hurt you. A lot of people are so hurt by their experience of church when they were growing up. And you talk about this uh, pretty freely too, about your experience, uh, your childhood church. And to start off by saying, yeah, we are a broken people, you're going to get hurt here, is such a powerful way of, one, not putting yourself up on a pedestal so that people will knock you down later, mm -hmm. and two, just saying, like being honest and realistic about what the church is about. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, J.C. Mitchell talks about uh, here, what about uh, in the church experience, in your church experience, what about including those who uh, may not be able to understand, may not have the cognitive abilities to understand, um, those with uh, developmental disabilities, for example. Um, do, you, do you have any experience with that and uh, what, they're, what they're getting out of uh, the experience? No, we, I, um, we only have people with spiritual disabilities in our community. I mean, I don't, I don't, we don't have anybody who um, outwardly is uh, sort of in an obvious way has developmental disabilities that I know of at our church. We do have children. And um, and I think the sort of the the words in the liturgy and the spirit of it and the actions of receiving the Eucharist, all of that is also communication, right? That's like the actions are communication. The music itself, even if you can't understand the words, is an act of communication. And so I think there are a lot of ways in which um, these things are understandable, um, not just by understanding sort of more, you know, these sort of theological ideas that, um, you know, are more academic, I guess. Good. Uh, Deb Hacken um, from Pennsylvania asks a question about uh, kind of a tension that people often feel with uh, forgiveness and justice, mercy and justice, I guess. Uh, she asks, how can we offer God's infinite mercy to others without diminishing the wrongness of their or our um, addiction to sin or addiction to doing things wrong, I guess. Yeah, um, I guess that would be like Bonhoeffer's thing about cheap grace. I guess um, I think that I think that forgiveness is only understandable when we've really articulated the harm that's been done by our sin, right? That it's not a general sort of ah, you know, I kind of screwed a few things up. The more sort of specific we are, the more we understand the power of forgiveness. Also, in the book, I talk about, you know, sometimes we don't want to forgive another person who's done harm to us because of the fact that it feels perilously close to saying what you did is okay, right? And if what they did was not okay, we don't want to in any way imply it was. And so, therefore, we're not going to forgive them. But really, those are two different things in that I feel like when God talks about forgiveness in a way, when we haven't forgiven someone, we're still linked to the harm that they did us, right? There's still some connection between us, this chain, right, that's connecting us to that harm. And that that can so easily be a way in which that comes and sort of finds the darkness in my own heart and inhabits it, right, that chain. And so really forgiveness is saying isn't saying, hey, what you did was okay, it's saying, what you did was so not okay, I refuse to be chained to it anymore. So forgiveness is like the bolt cutters that are coming and saying, I'm not, I actually am not even going to be connected to it anymore, right? So that's, that has to do with freedom, not saying what they did was okay. The other thing is, one thing that's brilliant, I encourage everyone to read the first 164 pages of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, is there are so many cringeworthy things in that book. I mean, you just have no idea how much it pegs human nature. But um, when they're talking about when we have a resentment, the, the big book says, if we look back far enough, we will find that at some point in the past, we made a decision based on self that put us in a position to be harmed. Meaning, the only freedom you ever really get is from really understanding what part you played in any kind of dynamic that's hurting you. We think we're going to get freedom by saying, by articulating to as fine a point as possible, 
what that asshole did to me, right? That feels good. It doesn't give us freedom. So freedom only comes from the way in which we say, hey, I didn't respect enough myself enough to get out of a situation that was harming me or, you know, whatever it was. I wanted the status that came with this situation and therefore I put myself in this position that ends up hurting me and other people, whatever it ends up being. That's where the freedom comes from. And I'm in this for the freedom, man. <laughs> yeah, I think w one of the things that, that that way of talking about forgiveness reminds me of is the concept of interdividuality in the meta theory, which is that we always know who we are in relationship to an other and space, other. And a lot of times those who harm us, like you're saying, Nadia, we begin to derive our sense of self by being in opposition to them or by right. withholding something from them. And and our identity becomes a victimary identity. And we don't see how we're tied. We're, we're always tied into others, as you said, into community. We, we don't know who we are ever in isolation. Mm -hmm. And to recognize that Forgiveness is the path of being untied from the wrong type of other, from someone who's not, doesn't have our best interests at heart, unfortunately, mm -hmm. is the path of freedom, which opens up the ability to be tied to other others <laughs> who in, in, um, that, that have your best interests at heart. So that mm -hmm. whole, it, it, it points out, I think people forget if people think about forgiveness as some act that I do as an individual towards some other person, then they get stuck in this that they're letting someone off the hook. But if you constantly see how we're connected, then the concept of forgiveness makes much more sense, I think, in the way that you described it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've got, well, shit, Nadia. I mean, we've got somebody who wants to bring up cussing. Oh, I hope, I hope what? I hope. Cussing. Cussing. Yeah. Oh, God, i got to tell you the story. I was lecturing at Wake Forest Divinity last week, and uh, this woman, I, I don't know what people's obsession is with my the way I speak, because, I don't know, it feels to me like most people talk like that, so I, it just feels weird that Christians are like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, where do you live? But, um... Anyway, uh, she was very nice, and she wasn't trying to be a jerk. She had just watched my lecture and was trying to test what she just saw, I think, this older lady. And she said, you know, well, I would have thought that, like, swearing is not okay, and it can be a sign of low intelligence because you have all, all these other words that you You know, you don't have to use those words. And I let, you know, I let her finish, and I, literally all I said was, um, man, I don't know. I'm smart as hell. And then, uh, next question. <laughs> How many times do you hear women in public go, I'm smart as hell? Half the time we're apologizing for taking up any space on the planet whatsoever, you know? Much less in front of a crowd of people going, no, I'm, I'm actually really smart. <laughs> Nicely done there. Um, Lisa, Lisa says that she wants to admit that she has been in a, actually in a process of scapegoating you, Nadia, um, because she was uh, recently fired at a church uh, where one of the accusations labeled against her was that she used the F word in the church office, and that was one of the reasons that they uh, kicked her out. And now that same church uh, is wanting them to read your book because it's <laughs> refreshing things about Nadia is that one of the refreshing things about Nadia is that she cusses. <laughs> so, oh. um, yeah, that's, that's kind of a uh, crazy experience, but, um, what, what, how people seem to not really have much of a problem with you being, I guess, real. And that's, that's one of the things that you've been labeled as, I guess, is being authentic and real. And, um, Especially when it comes to cussing, and I wonder how you how you feel about that label that's been thrust upon you. I think it's absolutely bizarre because of the fact that look, if somebody is a public figure because they're like a soccer player or because they're um, a mathematician or they're in any other subculture, why would somebody being who they are be fucking remarkable in any way? Why is that somehow? 
people always say that. They say either thanks for your honesty or um, or your authenticity is so refreshing. That's how high the bar is. People will wait in line after I speak somewhere to say thanks for not lying to me or pretending to be someone else. What does that say about the church that somebody like that that people will wait in line to say that to a leader? That's just bizarre to me. I just feel like it's sad. And there's so many kids like seminarians are you know sort of contacting me or 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 in a Q and A or whatever saying. Do you have any advice for me on how to stay true to myself? You know, when I go into ministry, I'm like, why is that even a thing? Why, like, if you, if God has called you with your giftedness and your brokenness and the whole package, why would you even have to think about how am I going to be myself when I'm in the context of pastoral ministry? I just, oh God, it, it just it. It makes it just yeah. it's extremely frustrating to me. I mm-hmm. I don't know what that says about us, but I don't think it's good. <laughs> no. Yeah. And then I um, love like how ironic is it that then people call that like my brand. So now like being being authentic is like actually a brand, you know? And <laughs> just, it makes me want to go back to bed. I would imagine that, that that is something that you could easily fall into the trap of needing to try to strive for, mm-hmm. like needing to like keep up this identity of being authentic, whatever that means, um, and, and that that could take up a lot of your energy. Uh, one of the things that you say in that video that you have with James is that faith is about relaxing, and I, I'm mm-hmm. kind of wondering what what – where do you take that? Where do you take that ability to, that James calls relaxing into faith? And if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I wonder if it's not sort of not having to, in like, invent yourself, right? I mean, to sort of, to relax is to just not have to sort of have that, that piece of our awareness that's constantly thinking, how am I being perceived right now, right? Like, how are people, you know, that's relaxing, that you don't even have to think about it. You don't have to think, oh, I have to watch my language, or if I don't watch my language, what are they going to say, or am I wearing the right thing, or, you know, there's so much of the management of the self that, that happens out in the world that um, that really faith should be a place where that really can just go by the wayside. That's why I preach so much about identity and where our identity actually lies and where it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, Shannon has a question for you. Do you find people excited about the openness of the community, but still do not want to let go of the angry, judgmental, vengeful, and wrathful God? Um, yeah, but I think it's often people who... Uh, you know, a lot of times it's uh, young queer folks who have been just sold a bill of goods about who they are and who God is, and and yet they love God and they want to be around God's people and they want to be part of a church, and yet they're really plagued with this idea of, well, what if I'm just being deceived? You know, what if what if it's just the devil is trying to make me think that it's okay? Or, you know, I mean, that's, you know, embedded theology um, is very hard to um, dig out from ourselves, you know? I mean, it's still in there. Even for myself, this is totally shameful to admit, but for me, um, it comes up sometimes that embedded theology that we sometimes don't even realize is still there, and, like, we've moved on, like, intellectually, and yet something will happen and it'll like kick it up again, and, you, and then you, I feel shame about that because I'm like I don't even believe that. Is there have been times? Oh God, I, I, people are gonna hate me for saying this. There have been times when I've seen a woman in a clergy shirt, and before I can stop it, my first thought is, who does she think she is? Like it's like before I can even stop it, and that's my vocation. <laughs> and so that embedded theology about women, it, like sometimes. Will, will creep up. And so I have compassion for these people 
who come in and they're like, I don't even really believe this anymore, but it's like in their DNA, you know? It, it's hard to let go of because, like you say, it's um, there's this sense of feeling. I loved when you said this sense of feeling that um, what if I'm being deceived? It, you know, to, it, and to let go of this need to get things right all the time and not be a patsy, not be um, shown up for having you know not gotten it right. It's I I remember that. Um, as a young person saying, I'm going to believe in God and go to heaven, even if it is, so I can go to heaven, even if it is a bill of goods, but I don't want to get, you know, make a mistake. And not get, so you can back into um, faith that way too, which is an odd thing. But just always want to protect yourself, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Covered all of the uh, big questions and comments chat room. So, uh, Nadia, thank you so much for being with us and yes. spending this time with us. We it was a pleasure. It. it was a joy. And uh, just a reminder to all of our listeners and watchers, you can buy Pastrix, uh, The Cranky, Beautiful Faith of a Sinner and Saint. Yep. And also, Nadia's other book is called Salvation on the Small Screen. Which um, approximately four dozen people have read that book, so <laughs> you can make it five. Nadia, okay. uh, you you will. I bought this actually at a used bookstore, and you will appreciate the writing that's on the inside of it. It's uh, to a woman named Melanie. Is there really? Uh, may we be full of the love of the Lord, the joy of Jesus, and totally irreverent. I feel the better, and uh, and then I can't read the rest of it. But, but um, it's, it's awesome. Uh, the gift that you have given, even in a book that, as you say, only 12 people have read, uh, that people have given to one another. Your irreverence and the joy that you bring to theology is one of the things that I think that the church needs going into the future. So thank you for sharing that with us Thanks. today. Yep. And, um, Thanks. And you can follow Nadia on Patheos, too, and read her sermons, which is a wonderful thing. Excellent. To be able to share that. Yeah. So thank you. Much. And thanks to everybody for your patience with getting the uh, the show on the road here today. And we'll see you next week with Ramal Toon um, talking about gangs and what we can learn from gangs. Gangs in the, the church. church. What fun. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Until then, peace be with you. Peace.